David M. Hart is the director of Liberty Fund's magnificent and influential Online Library of Liberty. If you have ever spent serious time reading deeply in classical liberal or libertarian sources, chances are you've either used OLL directly or wherever you were reading from got it thanks to people like David M. Hart. For many, many years now, Professor Hart has worked diligently to revive a cornerstone of this very show, the classical liberal theory of class conflict. His latest book, Social Class and State Power, is a reader in libertarian class theory, including documents from Richard Overton in the English Civil Wars, all the way down to libertarianism.org contributor Roderick Long. David M. Hart joins us now. Welcome to Liberty Chronicles, a project of libertarianism.org. I'm Anthony Comegna. So first I want to start out uh, fairly straightforward. What exactly is this thing, this category uh, that historians throw around so easily, it seems, um, this idea of class? What is it? Well, it depends because class can be defined in any way you like. You can talk about the class of redheaded people or the class of Australians who live in Indianapolis. Um, it, but it, it, what's really important is that is this distinction that you're making of any historical or political importance? And traditionally, class has been defined as um, a group of people who are able to get particular privileges um, for themselves uh, at the expense of other people. Um, and use this uh, access to power to um, enjoy greater wealth, uh, greater access to political authority, um, even to have the, their enemies killed or removed uh, by the use of force. Um, now, one of the things we tried to do in this book was to show that the, um, the people who think that power and the exercise of power has been important in helping to explain how societies function has been part of the classical liberal libertarian tradition going back four or 500 years. Um, but what's commonly mistaken, I think, is that class, especially in the universities uh, today, is seen as purely a leftist um, category. Um, and it goes back to Karl Marx, of course, who um, back in the 1840s began writing um, some very good journalism, as it turned out, about the uh, 1848 revolution that had occurred in Paris and coming to power of uh, Louis Napoleon, who eventually became Napoleon III. Um, but, and his definition of class was very different. He, his argument was that, uh, well, it was related, uh, but his extension of it was to say that anyone who is involved in a wage relationship with an employer was in a class-based relationship, which was exploitative. And this was a, a branch that went off in a different direction from a longer standing, I would say, classical liberal um, idea about class. Um, and that's become the dominant uh, definition of class, that anyone who is involved in the capitalist system, who makes a profit in a capitalist system, who pays wages to workers, um, is exploiting them by doing that, and that constitutes a class relationship. And the whole previous tradition of thinking about class as, as access to political power and, and getting using that to get privileges has been forgotten. It's gone down the Orwellian memory hole. And what we're trying to do in the book is to resurrect this older tradition uh, to say, A, it existed, B, Karl Marx borrowed from this tradition and then extended it in new directions, which happened to be completely wrong. Um, so we're trying to stake out a claim to territory, in other words. Mm. Now, again, the reader is called social class and state power. Uh, and as you said, the this classical liberal tradition of class analysis goes back at least 500 years. The first document you have is from Richard Overton in 1641. And I'm wondering, were there clear concepts of class before the early modern period? Uh, so not exclusive to a classical liberal view of class, but were, were there really any uh, senses of people belonging to a particular class in the pre-modern period? Uh, yes, there, there were, and I'll get to that in a moment. But just going back to the title, um, my preferred title for the book was Parasites, Plunderers and Plutocrats, uh, which, which happened to be words used by um, people in this broadly defined classical liberal tradition, but I was outvoted by my other editors. 
we got something much more anodyne and and social class and st state power. And that was done deliberately in order to appeal to leftists in the academy who might be more um, tempted to read the book or buy it. Um, but to go back to your original question about um, were there notions of of, of class um, before the early modern period? And, and you'd have to say, yes, there were. I mean, it was often back in the, the Greek and Roman period, uh, there was talk about tyrants and despots, uh, um, which I think was a very crude uh, a distinction. Um, uh, the people, um, the despot, the aristocrats, those kinds of very simple uh, social uh, divisions were, were used. And building upon that, um, starting, I think, in the early modern period, you have a much more uh, sophisticated um, or an appreciation of the complexity of society that could, needed to have other words and other uh, ways of describing what might have been a relationship between a a subject and a king, or a subject and um, a senator, or some, or, or tyrant of some kind, um, and that's what you get in uh, La Boetie, uh, who was a um, 16th century French author, was still thinking in these classical terms of uh, people versus tyrants. Uh, but, you know what what happens? Um, I think in this period you get the classic if you like, definition of a class relationship was the slave owner and the slave, uh, which, of course, is a crucial institution in the ancient Roman um, world. Um, and that continues up into the to the modern period. So that's, in fact, in the 1820s in France, when um, this new, these theories uh, about class were being rediscovered and explored, that was the classic uh, de definition of a class, uh, the slave owner, slave relationship. And it was extended to say, well, look, Napoleon wasn't literally a slave owner, but he enslaved the French people by taxing them and forcing them into the army and and, and, and so on. Um, and this became a kind of reference point for a further development of the notion. In some sense, is this an idea that has always been around um, and maybe even held by the vast majority of people? I mean, you think of, you know, your, your uh, ancient Chinese peasants and how they must have secretly hated the emperor. Um, and you know the. Well, but he made the rainfall. You know, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, they loved him for that. You know, is is this an idea that you think goes much deeper in in human existence than uh, you know social scientists and philosophers in the early modern period? I mean, I know you, there there are notions in the Greco-Roman world about masters and slaves, et cetera, et cetera. But in some sense, this seems very fundamental to the everyday human experience against the state. Well, I think the notion you're referring here is that is us and them. I mean, it's, uh, we are the pe the peasants uh, digging our plot of land, and um, every year we have to make a donation, quote unquote, um, to our lord and emperor. Um, but for most people, I think they just accepted that as the natural uh, part of the world. It's when people start to think that this is unfair or unjust that they, um, I think, changes the way they look at that relationship. Um, mm -hmm. And that, I think, is a, is a modern phenomenon. That somehow this is not right, or it's excessive, or um, there is another, maybe there's another way of doing things. And, but for, I think for most of human history, they, they didn't think that way. You know, it, it, it seems fairly popular or common to me for libertarians to date the, you know, origins of our set of ideas to the English Civil War as a very clear moment in time when, you know, the, the whole libertarian package started to emerge. What is special about the English Civil War? I'm, I'm glad you asked me that because I have a special fondness for the levelers. Um, I'm currently editing for the Online Library of Liberty a seven-volume collection of leveler tracts. Um, and you're quite right. I think there's something special about the 1640s where a lot of disparate ideas that you can trace back hundreds of years into the past about political structures and about um, elites and about uh, the relationship between elites and people um, come together in not a fully formed way, but in a sort of very precocious, uh, I call them proto-liberals, uh, proto-libertarians, because they're not quite there yet. But they're, on, they're so close, it's not funny. Um, but I think it's partly because of... Um, a crisis, a political and, and, and uh, economic and, and military crisis that forces people to do things and to see things in a different way. 
Um, and there are sort of these revolutionary moments that occur in history where suddenly people are forced. It's like the uh, the kaleidoscope. I mean, if you shake the kaleidoscope because of a revolution or a or a, a crisis in society and turn the the handles, you get a new um, collection, new image that appears out of the, the end of the kaleidoscope. And I think this is what happens in revolutionary moments. And it happens in 1640s in England. It happens in the um, 1760s um, and 70s in the United in, in America. And then it happens again in the 1780s in, in France. And um, and it's not uh, surprising that you get some flourishing of new thinking about politics and economics that come out of these uh, crisis situations. So for these for these generations of thinkers and activists, really, uh, plenty of them, especially in the English Civil Wars, are more properly categorized as activists. Um, for those in, in the English Civil War, the, the Enlightenment's, uh, going across Europe in the century afterward, what exactly was the the makeup of the classes to them? How did they think that social classes formed, and what kept them in existence? Well, to to go back to the um, English, I call it a revolution, not a civil war. Uh, well, aspects of both, of course. There was a notion, that, a very deep, deeply held notion that um, there was a traditional way of doing things. Um, uh, about making a living or going about your business, um, going to church on Sundays, and that this traditional way of doing things was being disrupted by people who wanted to do things differently and to, in, in, in case, you know, to impose a particular religious view or, you know, force people to um, join the army and go and fight, uh, you know, the Scots or whatever. Um, and it was this shock that uh, they're trying, other people, people outside us are trying to force us to do something that we don't want to do. And we've always done something else. And now we're being forced to change. So in a way, these revolutionaries are conservative in the sense they want to continue uh, to practice uh, the way things have been done for centuries. Now, this, can, of course, can be a myth. Uh, in the case of the, um, the levelers, there was this myth of Magna Carta or the myth of the Norman yoke. Um, that, you know, there was this period of Anglo-Saxon liberty before the Normans um, and, and this had been disrupted. Um, and now we have the Stuarts trying to impose all sorts of uh, new uh, religious practices, new taxes, uh, which go against tradition. And um, they begin to think of, you know, what is it that we, we did have that we're now losing? Right? We had property rights. We had we could keep uh, our earnings from our day-to-day -day business activities. We could uh, join a group of people to worship in a church uh, of our own choosing. And when these begin to be challenged, uh, people begin to think, well, why am I upset? You know, and I think, well, this is a right that I have. This is something that we've always had. This is our tradition. Um, and uh, that can be just done at a sort of an emotional, superficial level. But then you get people who start to think much more deeply about, well, where does our does our property right come from? And so it's not surprising that the levelers and then somewhat later Don Locke begin to formulate theories about um, the original appropriation of property and how you can do this in a non-violent way um, to the benefit of everybody. Um, and that once you have these uh, acquired properties, um, they become rights which uh, have to be protected and defended. And then you begin to have this whole development of, of a more coherent uh, libertarian theory about property rights. And much the same thing happens in, in the 18th century. You have wars being waged um, between France and England, uh, which spill over into N North America. And all the debt problems and all the taxation problems, again, um, cause a crisis where uh, the, the government has to raise more money. It has to uh, impose uh, conscription to get more troops to go off to uh, fight each other in North America. And, and this forces people to think, well, why are they doing this? What about my traditional behavior, which are now being defined or described as, as my rights to do this particular kind of behavior? Um, and you have, um, again, a flowering of, of wonderful political philosophers like Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson, um, who begin thinking and uh, arguing about, well, if the our government is the... Um, the threat to our traditional ways of doing things. How do we limit the power of the state um, to stop it from doing that in the future? Uh, and you have this wonderful experiment of uh, limited government that uh, um, is the United States, uh, at least in its uh, 
early few decades. Mm. And there's that wonderful line from Tom Paine I love so much that uh, America's purpose should be to begin government at the right end, you know, which to me always says the, the right end of society. Uh, from the bottom up, it should, it should come from the people themselves, and they really should rule themselves. Um, it's interesting that you mention him because he, he, he also is, in his um, great pamphlets uh, attacking the British uh, monarchy, uh, he's forced to go back into history and say, well, where did these kings come from? How did they acquire their power? How do they? Um, why did they? How do they justify their behaviour? And uh, he's one. He's a, one of my favourite authors who uh, goes back and says, "Well, if you look, um, if you lift up the carpet, you can see all the dirt underneath." And un- the real dirt is. He describes all monarchists, all kings, as just originally a group of banditti who seize power um, and force their way. They force themselves upon ordinary, hardworking people. Um, so he begins to think um, about history in a very different way, and in in this uh, strong class analysis, um, that you have this unproductive group of bandits um, who steal from the productive peasants, and um, instead of coming every um, harvest to seize the peasants' surplus, uh, they're, they're the roving bandits. Um, they set up shop and create and uh, build a castle, and suddenly they become permanent uh, bandits, um, and eventually, over time, uh, call themselves uh, kings and monarchs and princelings and so on. Um, and that was done by uh, Thomas Paine, sort of in, as a journalist. Um, but there, later, you know, in the 19th century, um, historians begin to actually delve much more deeply into the origin of aristocracy and the origins of monarchies and um, and again find the same uh, thing or uh, for example one of, one of my favorite French historians is Augustin Thierry who's writing in the 1820s and 30s and 40s uh, going through for the first time the official archives of the French government uh, looking at the origins of um, you know, the French state. Um, and he's very much in the same tradition as uh, Thomas Paine. Could you could you take a minute and tell us about the role of uh, the generation that you call the radical individualists and the Republicans, people like uh, William Godwin in England and William Leggett, one of my favorites in America? Yes, yeah, so well, you wrote a thesis on the Loco Focus. Yes, yeah. Yes, I was very intrigued uh, to see that because I... Uh, made it, it, it very important uh, uh, thing to include in the book was uh, um, some of those people uh, because it's um, it was a transatlantic phenomenon. It was happening in England and America. Um, you know, with William Leggett um, writing in America, and his equivalent in England was John Wade, who was another journalist. Um, uh, so there's striking similarities and. Um, what's happening here is that you have the French, the American and French revolutions um, being throwing up a, an enormous challenge to established elites and, and monarchies where um, traditional notions of allegiance um, are being challenged and changed uh, in a very r- dramatic fashion. And this continues um, well into the post-revolutionary period uh, into the early uh, 19th century. And um, the radicals from the Enlightenment and the revolutionary period don't disappear. They, they are still there. Um, and um, they're working um, as journalists, as, uh, as budding uh, novelists. Um, so you have the Mary Wollstonecrafts and the William Godwins, uh, who um, actually don't have a very large audience um, amongst established uh, readers, but they appeal to ordinary people in a way that hadn't been done before, except for perhaps Thomas Paine, writing pamphlets and writing um, newspaper articles and so on, and getting a following amongst not um, sort of like an educated working class, uh, the um, the working class that can read and take an interest in politics. And, and this is growing in size uh, in the early 19th century. Um, and that's where the, the press becomes so important because uh, of, of the technological changes that are occurring in the printing industry. The cost of p- publishing a newspaper or a book 
falls dramatically. And uh, as we know, you know, when the, the costs fall, there's just there's more of it uh, that's being purchased. And suddenly you've got this market for ideas, which is being um, satisfied by uh, radical journalists. And, and William Cobbett is just a wonderful example of that. And his, his enemy um, is very similar to uh, Cobbett, um, to, to Leggett and Cobbett, uh, are both um, identifying what they call the paper aristocracy. That there is a group of people who are very close to uh, power who control the banks and who are making who are lending money to the government in order to for the government to go you know have military activities uh, all over the place and uh, they the government is then taxing the people to pay back these loans and so you have this uh, uh, aristocracy of wealthy people who are lending money to the government so this period from sort of like 1810 to about 1840 or 50 is extremely important for this uh, this movement and um They've been largely forgotten, which I think is is really really sad. Uh, I mean, Liberty Fund has published a long time ago um, a collection of William Leggett's uh, journalist right, journalistic writings, um, but no one's done the um, the equivalent for, for some of the English uh, writers. Like I've put online um, some of the writings of William Cobbett in order to um, rectify this situation. But one of my favourites is is the guy I mentioned before, John Wade, who was a radical um, journalist, and um, he did something that needs desperately to be done again today. He, What he did was he went through all the government um, documents, uh, budget papers and, and, and so on, and made a list of everyone who lived off the state, everyone who got a grant or an income of some kind or a privilege, um, and he categorized it. He called it his black book. Uh, so these are all the people, the parasites who are sucking off the taxpayers' uh, blood. And it went through so many editions. Uh, it's like about five or six editions, and each one keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until at the end it's sort of like five or 600 pages of this compendium listing every single person uh, who gets a sinecure or a, I mean, a special um, privilege, a monopoly, um, what their salaries are if they're, in, you know, if they're a judge or a military officer. And um, one of the other big um, benefits that you could get was that if you were given a, a job in a ministry, uh, you might have um, the power to appoint members of your own family or friends to junior positions. Uh, so you could actually stack the bureaucracy with your family and all, you know, earn lots of money at taxpayer expenses. Um, and John Wade has got this great, great book, uh, which is, we had a bit of it in the um, anthology, but uh, we have the complete book um, on the OLL. Um, and what we desperately need today, today is to have journalists and historians uh, compiling data about um, the people today who are the, the beneficiaries of all sorts of government largesse, whether it's through contracts or, or uh, monopolies or um, tariffs, which is a big issue at the moment, uh, um, or even just benefits of various kinds. Because uh, we really don't know um, what the monster is, you know, what, what, a, what part of the monster, you know, what tentacles, you know, that we see all a part of this huge monster that's sucking um, taxpayers' uh, money out of the system. One of the things that you've written about uh, regarding this class analysis is that as time goes on and as the state gets more and more intrusive and involved in uh, one thing after another, it becomes very murky and difficult to distinguish who exactly is and is not a beneficiary of the state. Uh, and so this this idea of th that class is directly linked to uh, your access to government power um, becomes hard to delineate and hard for people to identify with. And you know, to my mind, this might explain the rise of Marxism to some degree. Uh, Marx says, "Oh no, no! Turns out it's very clear." Uh, do you own? A, do you earn a wage? Well, then you're in the working class. And if you own property, uh, certainly if you own capital, well, you're just a capitalist. And it's it's as simple as that for Marx. There really isn't much more of of uh, a you know room for other explanations in his thinking. Um, could you tell us what exactly did happen to the liberal theory of history or the liberal class analysis over time? Why did Marx and Marxism overtake it? Yeah, that's that's one of the 
big and tough questions that we have to answer. I mean, it's it's in the broader picture, it's it's partly um, the general decline of classical liberalism in the nineteenth and centuries, and it's practically it's practical disappearance in the first half of the twentieth century. So that's sort of like the big picture standing behind. Um, you're quite right that uh, um, one of the appealing things about the Marxist theory of class is its uh, apparent simplicity. Um, it's the workers versus the capitalists. Um, and of course, what happens in the 20th century is when you do have Marxist or socialist governments, um, you do have the reappearance of class in the sense that there are people who have privileged positions within the government who have uh, privileged access to resources at ordinary workers' expense. And the idea that there could be class rule within a socialist system would have been completely um, uh, inconceivable to Marx. But the fact that it happened suggests that his thinking about class was completely erroneous. The, the classical liberal view also had its um, oversimplification. And this is something that uh, Rothbard picked up with his interest in Calhoun, because one of the things that Calhoun said was you have taxpayers who are paying taxes and, and into the system, and then you have um, tax receivers, people who get benefits from the government, um, who receive the taxes in the form of subsidies or monopolies or um, handouts or whatever. And um, even Ta Calhoun could say, see that there, this is uh, complicated because some people might pay taxes but also get benefits from the government. And so he came up with the idea of there were net taxpayers and net, net tax receivers, and meaning that if you're a net tax payer, you paid more in taxes than you received in benefits. And this is something that Rothbard took up. But as you said, the, the modern interventionist state where the state is and regulations are so pervasive, the mixture now is so complicated that, that uh, uh, it's very hard to calculate whether, you know, I'm pers am I personally a net taxpayer or a net tax receiver because I drive on the roads? Um, you know, I get uh, police protection um, supposedly from the local police. Um, and so on, and, and I think that's where um, you know the more much more research needs to be done by libertarian scholars and, 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 and writers uh, to try and identify who are the groups who perhaps benefit more uh, than most um, from our very complicated system of redistribution and privileges and and, and, and red, led legislation. I mean, you can identify um, some some groups like people who work for the government. All right, who are government bureaucrats um, are obviously net tax uh, receivers, um, but then you have other people who uh, whose status changes over time. So, for example, you might be uh, an ordinary person working in the private sector all your life, paying um, taxes, and then when you retire and get onto um, social security. Um, and we start receiving benefits from the government, uh, that your situation changes. Uh, um, have you paid in more um, in taxes over your working life than you will receive in benefits afterwards, or it'll be the same, or it's, it's very, very complicated. And that's where some very hard thinking has to be done. Um, but I think you can, and the other related thing to this is, is are your interests, are your political views colored by the uh, how you receive your income? Um, do you have a different view of the state if you are a government paid bureaucrat versus a small private um, person in business? Um, what about uh, as if you're older or younger? I mean, uh, older people uh, who are receiving benefits, may they, they may have been anti-state when they were younger, but when they get older, they say, well, no, maybe, you know, we do need to have a social security system and it's, it's working for me and, you know, it'll work for others. Um, so, but I think you can identify certain groups where it's it's very clear um, that they are beneficiaries of the current system, and you, you might uh, consider them to be members of the ruling elite or the ruling class. I mean, you have you do have a political class. You have people in 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 the uh, Congress, in the House of Representatives, um, in various uh, important um, government bureaucracies who. Um, their political views are obviously pro-state, pro-intervention. You know, we're doing – no one else can do this job, and this is a job that has to be done. Um, but you can also identify other groups, um, and I call them the dependent class, and this is a really troublesome uh, group of people. They, these are people who are, like, permanently unemployed or, um, you know, we, they talk about um, – 
generations of people who are, you know, unwed mothers and on on, uh, on various uh, government uh, programs and so on. They're not actually exploiting anyone. I mean, they just um, they're poor, they're weak, uh, um, they need assistance. Um, but they're not exploiters, quote unquote, in that they're stealing from other people. But they are beneficiaries, and they are dependent upon the system of redistribution. And I feel um, that that's a problem, problematical class politically, because uh, a they're never going to vote um, to change the system to terminate their benefits, because it would not be in their self-interest to do so. But I don't see them as taking active steps to um, plunder, to use Bastiat's phrase, to plunder the um, the taxpayers of the country. Um, it's it's very complicated. Um, but I still think class uh, thinking, at least in the libertarian. Um, perspective can help unpick some of these um, knots and problematical areas. Um, and that's why we need so much more research uh, done on this. And I would encourage, you know, younger uh, people uh, thinking about a, a career that this might be an avenue um, worth uh, pursuing, especially if you're a journalist. I mean, I think this is wonderful territory. Um, th- there's there's some great blogs out there um, where the, the, Economists are looking at the beneficiaries of, of Trump's new tariffs. You know, it's, uh, how many um, companies um, purchase steel or al- aluminium uh, to make other things uh, who are opposed this, to this tariff versus this much smaller group of people who produce domestically produce um, iron and aluminium. Um, and it's like about 10 to 1. I mean, the, the, the businesses who consume steel and aluminium uh, 10 and, and the, the number of um, companies that are benefiting from Trump's uh, uh, intervention here is, um, is is really quite small, and yet they get the legislation passed. Classical liberal historians looking for some sort of you know big broad patterns across long swaths of time. Um, they've often argued that class formation and conflict. Uh, really produces what we call history, the big movements and moments uh, that get recorded in the big books that go away in the libraries forever until somebody like you and me finally checks them out. Is there any possibility of ending the existence of social classes and therefore putting a halt to the process of history as we've known it? You use the word social class there, which is interesting because um, there are always going to be groups of people um, with shared interests and uh, shared behaviours. Um, um, so, for example, uh, a social class might be you know, the group of, of, of working women, for example. Um, and as long as women continue to work and, and have shared interests, that we, you can write histories about um, their experiences and their um, the challenges that they face, you know, in terms of discrimination or whatever. Um, and that can be very interesting. But what we're talking about here, I think, is more a political class, and, and that is the use of um, or people seeking political power or ultimately the, to use co- coercion against others in order to re- get things for themselves at other people's expense. And that is a kind of con- – that is real conflict. That is, you know, because there are people who have to pay for this, don't want to. The people who want to receive something for nothing obviously have chosen that uh, as a way of um, making their, their, their living and uh, want to continue with that. And those two groups, those two classes, if you will, are at loggerheads. And as long as there are governments um, that can dispense privilege, dispense taxpayers' money, there will be this conflict. And that's what you're getting at, that this conflict over time um, creates history, quote unquote. You know, it's uh, going back over the 20th century, you can see, you know, the, the rise of Roosevelt and the New Deal and so on and the, the controversies that that caused and the um, both intellectual and political struggles that went on, pro and con. Um, and that's, I think, just a given of history. And the other question or the, what I think you're implying is that if we get rid of a state that's powerful enough to dispense this power and privilege and, and taxpayers' money, would that change history? Would we, would, we would get a different kind of history. Instead of ha- writing history about the conflict between the people who ultimately have to pay the taxes and the people who ultimately get the benefits of, of access to government power, that would disappear and, and you would have a different kind of history. And the history would be then more about 
what do ordinary people do with their lives? You know, what are their interests and conf- and dis- disagreements and, and challenges and uh, what? Are, and that would be, you know, history then would be intellectual history, history of ideas, what people are generating. You know, what are they writing about? What are they p- playing on their you know headphones? Um, there would be social history. You know, how are social classes or ethnic groups um, uh, changing over time and developing a new and, and interesting areas, or the movement of people from one country to another, or economic history. I mean, uh, the constant or scientific, uh, uh, technological history, all, all the changes and uh, that's occurring and uh, innovations. That kind of history, I think, is really, really interesting. And perhaps we will, uh, maybe not, in, obviously not in my t- lifetime, but uh, maybe. Um, there would no longer be uh, any political history, if you like, um, in a future libertarian society, just social, economic, intellectual, scientific histories. For many decades now, and for reasons we will no doubt explore further, the liberal or libertarian theory of class has been a sort of elephant in the room. It's definitely there, baked into our history, our language, and even our politicking. But yet no one wants to discuss it for fear we upset the whole party. Yet in the libertarian movement's most successful periods, the times when our ideas and actions meant the most and changed the world for the better, those libertarians openly embraced and constantly refined their notions of class. To my thinking, we are long overdue for a renaissance in libertarian thinking about class, and history itself for that matter. So thank the gods we have people out there like David Hart. Liberty Chronicles is a project of libertarianism.org. It is produced by Tess Terrible. If you've enjoyed this episode of Liberty Chronicles, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes. For more information on Liberty Chronicles, visit libertarianism.org dot org.